All right, welcome to module number nine. Um, in this module, we're going to focus on careers in biology. So the remainder of the semester, um, we're going to focus on essentially careers, um, what careers are available to you as a biology major, and then how do you become competitive for careers, how do you look for uh, jobs, apply for jobs, and things like that. And we'll finish up the semester uh, with, with that type of topic. All right. So the nice thing about the biology degree is that it's very broad, and, and in fact, with just a bachelor's in biology, um, you have lots of options for careers. Many of you already know what you want to do, um, but I want to give you kind of a survey and overview of all the possible careers you can get into, and more importantly, it gives you a better idea of kind of what to look out for in the future um, after you graduate. So uh, basically, I want to focus on today's topic about um, careers in biology what can you do with a biology degree and how can you actually prepare um, for different careers in biology because every different career has different kind of requirements of what you're going to need to do um, in the future. So this is going to be similar to kind of some of the previous other modules where um, it'd be helpful if you download the homework and kind of do it as we go along. Um, it's not a big deal, you can easily just do this at the very end of the presentation. Uh, so either way it's up to you. But the first thing I want you to do is just write down essentially what your career goals are. So activity one in the homework is going to ask you what's your career goal? Uh, why did you choose that goal? So, so what was the motivation behind that? Um, a common question you're going to get in maybe job interviews as well is where do you see yourself in 10 years? And that's an important question because it may just be, oh, I see myself as a doctor, but it might be something like, oh, I see myself in California. I want to live in California. All right, and, and that will govern sometimes what career you might want to get into um, because of certain locations. So be aware of that. Think about where do you want to be in 10 years from now. And if that if location's not that big of a deal, then that's fine. And then the last question, which is a very important question, is um, what is one barrier that you face to reach this goal? You have to be aware of the barriers in front of you that might inhibit you from getting the career you want because if you're not aware of them, how do you know how to address it and attack it? So be honest with yourself. What are some barriers that you're going to face? And if you're not sure what are some of the barriers, then just put, I'm not sure, because it's important to understand that you might have to find and look elsewhere for what's going, what, what are some of the hard things about getting this career. All right, so pause the video and go ahead and do activity number one. And you can do activity number two at the same time. Um, and essentially, this is a one-minute paper. I want you to like set a timer for 60 seconds. And essentially, write down as many biology careers as you can think of. All right, so just think of anything. Try and be as specific as possible. All right, so go ahead and pause the video again on your homework and, and do activity number one and number two. All right, so maybe you came up with a nice list. Uh, many of you will come up with lists, things like doctors and PAs and um, researchers and things like that. But I want to tell you about all the fields in biology. So there's basically uh, what I would call healthcare careers. Um, so careers that you're going to be, you know, uh, dealing with patients and taking care of clients and patients. There are government careers, and then uh, there are research careers, and then there's lots of careers in between that I'll tell you about as well. But I want to start with research careers. So many of you are interested in biology and you want to basically study biology as a career and that's essentially a career in research. And be aware that research is very broad and when you get involved in research you have to kind of narrow your focus down because if you try to just study biology it's, it's too much. Um, so many of you will come into an undergrad program really passionate about a specific topic in biology and you, you get kind of frustrated because a lot of the courses aren't really focused on that just one topic you're interested in. And the reason for that is undergraduate education is trying to give you a very broad foundation of things that you need to know so that when you graduate with your bachelor's, you can then go and specialize. So be aware that all the specialization that you might be looking for happens after um, an undergraduate degree typically. And you will typically go to a graduate school and get um, graduate degrees and focus on certain areas. And the areas of research are broken down into two broad categories. One is called biological research or what we'll call kind of the natural sciences. And then the other is biomedical research. So here are some examples of what fields are in biological research. I try to think of as many as I could, 
but be aware that this is not all-inclusive. So things like bioethics, this is actually a field of biological research, um, and it's kind of a mixed field. So think of that case study about um, the MMR vaccine and some of the ethical considerations that were in that. There's actually degree plans in bioethics that you can specialize in. But things like ecology, evolutionary biology, vertebrate or invertebrate zoology, depending on what um, specific field you want to get into, uh, ichthyology, which is study of fish, ornithology, birds, conservation science, wildlife biology, and marine biology, of course. And every single one of these boxes here is actually a separate specialized graduate program that you would go into. So if you're interested in, say, wildlife biology, you want to look for wildlife biology graduate programs. And throughout the country, there are universities that have a specialized program just for that field of research. And that's what you're going to go to and specialize in. You're going to get a degree in wildlife biology, typically a master's or a PhD possibly, and you're going to be basically getting a career in research in that field. All right. So if you're interested in, in biology, in some aspect of a career in biology and bio biological research, you really want to start researching all of these different fields, finding graduate programs, and looking at what are they really studying. Um, and, and when you graduate, you, you hopefully will pick one of those. Now be aware that biology nowadays is not just in its own little box. So a lot of these fields are going to overlap. So for example, wildlife biology is going to incorporate a lot of ecology in it. So don't, don't think that you just have to pick one and you can't study anything else. So uh, just be aware of that. And the uh, other field of research is biomedical research. And biomedical research is essentially studying biology but in the context of essentially disease. And you're studying the application of biological concepts to uh, disease and uh, more medically relevant concepts and topics. And so here you'll see an example of fields of research that fall into biomedical. Things like physiology and pharmacology, cell biology and bacteriology, those type of fields are all biomedical typically. They don't have to be. You can be a fish physiologist, of course. Um, anatomy, neuroscience, and immunology oncology, which is the study of cancer, and genetics, um, embryology, which is the study of developmental biology, and kinesiology. Uh, and then these two are interesting, bioinformatics and systems biology. Because of all the data now in biological science, um, there's a great need for computer science and biology. And essentially what that is is bioinformatics and systems biology. How do we analyze all of this large amount of data and how do we make sense of it? So if you're really interested in kind of more of a computer science standpoint um, of biology, these type of programs, first of all, are very fast growing programs. So there's lots of jobs available for them. Um, but they're also something that you might be interested in, in doing because it will incorporate a lot of computer science along with the biology knowledge. Both of these programs <coughs> are research programs. So you, in order to get into these programs, um, you basically are getting a career in research. So there's lots of ways to get careers in research. And the first and the easiest is as an undergraduate. And so as an undergraduate right now, you can get involved in research. And we talked about that in module number three, about undergrad research. And in fact, if you are interested in research, I would highly recommend you do this because you really want to test whether or not um, that research is for you. You want to make sure you're going to like it uh, before you maybe go get a career in it. With a bachelor's degree, unfortunately, there's not a lot of jobs in research. There's not a lot of long-term jobs, but you can get an entry-level position, typically um, as a research technician, and you can get that with a bachelor's degree, a BS. So if you're not sure you want to go get a graduate degree, um, one thing I would recommend you doing is graduate with your bachelor's and look for a research technician job um, at usually universities, but any research place will have these jobs available. And go ahead and spend a year or two doing research and um, you can kind of work your way up from there. Many times research technicians will also have a master's and I'll, I'll talk to you about, oh, here are the two degree programs. So when you graduate UWF with your bachelor's, typically if you're interested in research, you'll go to graduate school and then go to some of those programs that we were talking about and specialize in some type of field. There's two types of degrees you can get in graduate school. One is a master's degree and one is a PhD degree. So master's of science is MS and PhD is a doctor of philosophy, but um, it's your highest degree level 
essentially in research. Master's programs are typically two to three years, and you, you do research and you do a thesis project and you graduate. And then the jobs available to you as a master's are typically within a research lab and you're helping the lab um, do experiments or, or field work or so on. A PhD is rough, can be anywhere from about four years at the very fastest to seven or eight years sometimes, depending on the program. So they can be a much longer program. Um, it's, a, it's a terminal degree, meaning it's the highest degree in research. And typically, if you're interested in research, but you want to have your own lab, or you want to run your own programs, or kind of run your own groups and be a leader within research, and maybe come up with the ideas and things like that, write grants, etc., you really want to go after a PhD, because that's going to allow you to get the jobs and the careers um, that will give you that opportunity. So researchers work in all types of settings, um, not just in um, academics, but there are lots and lots of universities in the country that do research, and so the most common type of position is typically in a, in a university setting, um, either as a research technician or as a faculty member or um, someone else. Pharma industry is the pharmaceutical industry, and so obviously there's very large companies, um, and their job is pharmaceutical research. Uh, so if you're interested in kind of biomedical science, um, these are available to you. There's lots of jobs available in pharmaceutical industries. Biotechnology industry is also um, is any company that essentially makes products for research companies, um, and so they hire a lot. Agriculture is now using a lot of science and a lot of research technology, of course, so the agricultural industry also hires researchers. The U.S. government does a large amount of research of so things like the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, um, all have their own government research labs that you'll find throughout the country. And then there's always private research institutions throughout the country as well. So there's lots of research in the U.S. Um, and as a biology major, you are, are, you are qualified to work in all of those settings. And then if you, if you go to a graduate school, you can specialize. So if you're interested in working in a pharmaceutical industry, then you can go get a, a master's or a PhD in pharmacology or immunology or something biomedical related and then be competitive for those jobs. One thing um, that students kind of do when I tell them about graduate school is they don't like the idea because it has the word school in it and they say, I don't want more school. I'm, you know, I'm tired of going to school. I've been here for four years or more at UWF and I just want to get a job. And one thing I want to bring up to you is that, yes, graduate school is school, but treat, treat it more of like an entry level job. Because what you might not be aware of is that when you go to graduate school, you actually will get paid. Okay, you'll get a stipend. And here's an example of FSU just down the road in Tallahassee. And this is their biology department. And if you are a master's student, you get a stipend of $21,239 a year. And a PhD gets a stipend of slightly more, $22,143. So you get a stipend. On top of that, you typically get a health insurance a supplement. And you also get, I'm, not, I'm missing it, here it is you also get a full tuition waiver, so you actually don't pay tuition, you just pay fees, essentially. And I don't know how much the fees are, but they're not, they're not too much. So you're, you're getting a stipend every single year when you're in graduate school, and it's typically enough to live on. And the reason you're getting the stipend is because you are doing work for the university. You're either teaching a course or teaching a lab sometimes, um, or you're doing research for the university, and that's helping the university out. And so they're paying you. So if you treat graduate school more of like a, a job, um, it's not, you are taking courses and things like that in specializing, right? But it's not just school where you're paying uh, out of pocket. This is unique to, to the sciences because of some, a lot of other graduate programs, you actually do have to pay full tuition to get that graduate degree. But biology is different. So be aware of that. And every university in the country follows this model. Some stipends are different at different universities. So you can kind of shop around. Okay, so what will make me competitive for graduate school? Um, most graduate schools have a minimum GPA of 3.0, so you got to have above a 3.0. If you have slightly below, it's possible, but nowadays graduate school is getting pretty competitive. So 3.0 or higher, you have to take an entrance exam, and the entrance exam for graduate school is called the GRE, the Graduate Record Exam. And typically you want to score, what's competitive for graduate school is scoring above the 50th percentile, so you want to be above average on this exam. This exam is essentially a, like an SAT. It's like a bigger SAT. It has a verbal and a quantitative reasoning, so math section on it. 
Um, it's, it's truly not that difficult for our majors once you have been a major in biology. Um, you can handle this test pretty easily. You do want to study a little bit, probably about a month in advance for it, but it's nowhere near some of the other entrance exams. And then anything you do as an undergraduate is going to help you for graduate school. So if you've done an internship or undergraduate research, or if you had a job in the field that you want to go into, that just makes you all the more competitive. So you can get into grad school with just a, a GPA and a GRE with no experience whatsoever. But if you're looking at some competitive graduate programs, you know, at very well-known universities and things like that, you definitely want to have previous experience to really make you that much more competitive. So again, our, our, the biggest encouragement we can give you is, is if you're interested in research, get involved in research here now because it's just going to help you in the long run. Last thing you're going to need are letters of recommendation from faculty members. And this is important. You, you need people to recommend you to the graduate schools. So that again argues for getting involved on campus here because most faculty won't know who you are unless you're around, unless you're working in someone's lab maybe or being part of a student organization or um, just, just being a familiar face and talking to your faculty members. So always be aware that it's important to talk to the faculty. Um, sh show them your interest in, in graduate school. We all went to graduate school, so we're very familiar with it. If you have questions about graduate school, then feel free to ask your faculty members. All right, so let's just switch gears. So some of you are interested in research, and you're going to end up wanting to go to graduate school or look for an entry-level position as a bachelor's. Many of you are interested in the other side of kind of the biology major careers, and that's the healthcare side of it. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through almost every single healthcare career I can think of and just focus on kind of what's the same and what's different about them. So be aware that all of these healthcare careers are going to require um, extra schooling outside of undergraduates. Um, so you, you typically can't get a bachelor's and then go right into healthcare. All right, so the first, of course, is physicians. So many of you are pre-med, um, and these are obviously doctors, typically doctors that you're thinking of, uh, medical doctors in hospitals and clinics, and there's lots of specialties. You can basically be a general practitioner and you, or a surgeon or any, anything in between. Uh, many of you may not know there's two types of physicians, essentially, or two types of medical schools. Uh, one is uh, the doctor of medicine, which is the MD. This is called allopathic medicine. And the other is doctor of osteopathy, or a DO, and this is osteopathic medicine. And so these are two separate medical schools that people can go to and get trained. And there's really not much difference nowadays between these two types of doctors. Um, just uh, some of the basic philosophies behind the training and the teaching is what's different. But by the time you graduate and become a, a practitioner of medicine, um, there's not much difference between MDs and DOs anymore. But just be aware that they are separate schools. They have kind of separate application process um, and, and things like that. If you're interested in research, but you're also interested in healthcare, there, like we mentioned in the undergraduate research module, there is also a combined MD-PhD degree. Um, these are highly competitive, but um, we've had students go and, and, be, and get into these programs. And the one reason why they're highly competitive is if you're in the MD-PhD program, they will actually give you a stipend, kind of similar to grad school, so you, you'll get paid, and you usually get tuition waivers. So you actually, they pay for your medical school. So a lot of times you can graduate without any, any debt, although um, these are really competitive. People who are interested in MD-PhDs or who get these degrees typically end up um, doing research in an academic setting. And so they're interested in doing healthcare in a university setting and, and things like that. But there are other types of healthcare careers as well. And I'm going to try and go through this list. Um, I'm not going to go too, too fast or I don't you know, want to belabor the point. But there's, there's lots of ways that you can get involved uh, in working with patients. And some are easier than others. But being pre-med, getting into medical school, it can be difficult. Um, some of these programs are easier to get into, some are actually harder to get into. So we'll start with physician assistant. This is a PA, and these are people who uh, essentially work with the physicians in clinics, and they can they do lots of things. They can diagnose. They can um, you know they, they can specialize a little bit. Um, it's a shorter program than med school, so it's a two-year program. It's a master's level program, so you get a master's of science. Um, you don't get an MD. Um, and you basically will go attend uh, PA schools. A couple of things about PA schools. One, PAs bec are becoming highly competitive now. It's, it's actually getting almost as difficult as med school to get into. And one other thing, if you're interested in being a PA, be aware that they require 
Um, most schools require 500 hours of what they call direct patient contact. And what that means is while you're an undergrad or before you go to their school, you need to accumulate 500 hours of dealing with patients. And so there's lots of resources online for how to get those experiences, but that's something that you need to be aware of because that's a lot of hours and you want to get that, that going as soon as you can. Medical technologists, uh, these are people in the hospital that work in hospital clinics. Um, and so if you've, if you've ever gone to a doctor's office or a hospital and gotten blood drawn or you know samples taken, um, they ship them to the lab. And the lab is the one that does the diagnosis and the, the determination of what's, what's in that sample. Those are medical technologists. So um, they don't do necessarily direct patient contact, although sometimes they will do actually draw blood. Um, but they analyze all the samples and do a lot of the pathology that you'll see um, in the medical field. This is typically a one-year um, training uh, program out, uh, after your Bachelor of Science. And in fact, UWF has its own clinical lab science or medical technology program. And essentially, it's incorporated into a bachelor's degree. So you can, you can graduate with a bachelor's in clinical lab science. I think it adds about a year extra to the typical bachelor's of biology. But once you're done, you can go get a job as a medical technologist. And there's always jobs available for, for them. Um, optometry, so if any of you have, um, uh, need corrective lenses, this is essentially you go visit an optometrist and then optometrists can specialize and do surgeries as well and things like that. This is a separate school, an optometry school, and it's a doctoral level program. Um, be aware that optometry schools are typically significantly easier to get into than medical schools and things like that. So, um, you know, if you, let's say for example, someone doesn't get into med school or can't get into med school, um, optometry is definitely a way to go. You get to deal with patients and, and help people all day long. Um, it, it can be a rewarding career. Podiatry as well are doctors who essentially specialize in foot care. And you get an, you get an MD, but essentially you're a doctor of podiatric medicine. Um, it's a separate med school. You do have to take the MCAT to get into it, but it's significantly less competitive than um, other med schools. And so it's definitely an option for people. And Podiatry now is a growing field because you have to think of things like athletics um, and, and uh, foot care for elderly patients and things like that. Um, there's a high demand for uh, doctors of podiatry. Pharmacy is another separate school. Again, uh, you will basically get a doctorate in pharmacy it's called a PharmD. Uh, and this is a doctor level program. And pharmacy schools, if you get a degree in pharmacy, you might think, oh, you're just going to work at CVS as a pharmacist or Publix as a pharmacist, but in reality, you can do a lot of things. You can get involved in pharmacology research. You can work in a hospital setting. Um, there's lots of potential careers in pharmacy. Dentistry, again, it's a separate health school. Um, these are doctoral level programs, so you either get a DDS or a DMD. There's really no distinction nowadays between those two different degrees. Um, and essentially, uh, you have to apply to dent dental schools. And uh, they have a separate entrance exam, and it, and it is competitive. It's about the same competitiveness as medical schools now. Physical therapy and occupational therapy are available at both a master's and a PhD level. Um, and there are lots of jobs in, in, these, in these fields and lots of um, settings for these fields. So you can obviously work in a separate private clinic. There's physical therapy clinics within hospitals and, and other um, clinical settings. Uh, occupational therapy uh, clinics as well. So there, there's lots of opportunity if you're interested in, in physical therapy. Epidemiology and public health are typically a, a grad program that you'll find throughout the country. Um, you can either get a master's in it or a PhD. And if you're not familiar with, with what they do, these are essentially people like this from the CDC. So these are people who are interested in disease on a population level. So uh, disease, essentially public habits of, of health and, and things like that. So a, a lot of times, so for example, in the news nowadays is all the information about the Zika virus. Well, epidemiologists are the people who are studying the virus infection rates and the population and so on. And then you have scientists at the bench top that are trying to study the biology of the virus itself. But if you're more interested in about, you know, all the rates and, the, and tracking the disease progression and tracking how the virus is spreading, epidemiology is really a field that you might want to look into. <clears throat> All right, then some, some other ones you might not be familiar with, you can be a genetics counselor. There's programs for this. It's a two-year master's program, and essentially you can help people who, are, who have a variety of genetic ailments, maybe infertility issues, um, things like that. 
uh, audiologists, if you've ever had an audiogram or um, you know, had to have your child have a, an audiogram, audio test, um, these are people essentially who diagnose and treat hearing problems. This is a separate PhD program. So every single one of these is essentially a separate school all right, that you apply to. And then veterinarians, of course. So this is a doctoral level program. You get a doctor of veterinary medicine, DVM. Um, vet, vet school is probably one of the highly, most highly competitive schools of all, all of this whole list. And the reason is there are just so few vet schools in the country. Um, and it just, it just makes a bottleneck. There, it's, fairly, it's fairly competitive. All right, so what will make you competitive for healthcare careers? Um, it really depends on the career you're looking at, but I'm going to go off of the major ones like dental school, med school, vet school, those type of, those type of ones. Um, you need a high GPA, and typically I say about a 3.25 or higher. Unfortunately, if you're below a 3.25, you're just very you're below the averages and all the standard deviations, and you just might not be very competitive for those careers. You have also on top of that, you have to take some very difficult entrance exams. So for med school, you have to take the MCAT, which is probably one of the more difficult tests. The DAT is very similar to the MCAT. That's also difficult. This is for dental school. The PCAT is for pharmacy school, and the GRE is used for a variety of other schools like PA schools, um, and so on. Um, so not only do you have a strong GPA, you have to score high on those tests as well. If you're interested in healthcare, there's some other things that you want to do. You, like we've been mentioning before, you want to get involved as an undergraduate on a variety of things. One thing that uh, health career, healthcare careers are looking for is volunteer experience because they want you to be dedicated to helping others. And one thing that shows that dedication is by volunteering in your community. So many of the student organizations will do volunteer events to try and get you get help you get those experiences. On top of that, you also will want to gain some type of clinical experiences, and, and it really depends on what your healthcare career uh, goal is. But for example, many pre-med, pre-dental students will need to shadow someone. They'll need to you know shadow a, a dentist or shadow a physician and get experience for what they do, understand what medicine is, um, and things like that. And not only is that important, but it also helps you network with your community doctors and helps you get letters of recommendation. Oh, and like I said, you'll also need strong letters of recommendation. And if you're interested in healthcare careers, not only do you need letters of recommendation from faculty, but you also need letters of recommendation from typically clinicians. And in fact, if you're interested in PA school, they actually will require, I think, the majority of your letters from PAs. So you, you have to get into networking. And the best way to do that, honestly, is just to start cold calling clinics and at, telling them you're pre-med or pre-PA or whatever and asking if you can shadow or volunteer in their office. Okay, a couple other things, uh, other types of careers that you might not think about because it's not like the big two that we always see students fall into is teaching. So you might not have thought about it, but education is a very important career um, choice for biology majors because we need good scientists to be educators. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have in the country right now is, is poor STEM education at the K through 12 levels. And so there's a big push and you'll actually hear about this throughout this university for training biology majors to get into teaching. There's lots of financial rewards, so be aware that you might think, oh, I don't want to teach. Look into it, because a lot of times there are some really good deals, um, things like student loan payback programs, you get summers off, um, you know, you get certain pay scales depending on your degree and training and so on. So there's lots of uh, rewards for teaching. If you're going to teach at through K-12 level, um, you need a bachelor's degree and you're typically going to need a teaching certificate. Now, uh, many people will go and get an education degree and then go teach at these levels. You don't need that, um, but depending on what level you're teaching, you're going to need to get certified and usually the school or the program you're going to be part of that will help you can help you do this. If you really want to teach at a college level, so you don't want to teach, say, high school or middle school, um, if you want to teach at a college level or even a medical school or a graduate school, you typically are going to require what we call a terminal degree, which means the highest degree you can get. And that's either going to be a PhD in a research field or an MD as a, as a physician. Some colleges, some smaller colleges and community colleges, will actually hire teachers with a master's uh, level degree. So you can get a master's and start applying and see if you can teach at different universities. Um, but that, so that is an option to you, but typically you're going to need a PhD. 
if you're really interested in writing or you're really good at writing and you, you kind of like both science and writing, you can actually get an entire career in science writing. And in fact, here's an example of a graduate program from the University of Florida School of Journalism where they have a specified or a dedicated science writing slash journalism program and you can get a master's degree in this. So if you want to write for publications or you just want to get into writing and communication, this is kind of the graduate program that you're going to want to get into. Also, if you're really good at illustrations or you want to get, you, you maybe you have a hobby of being an artist, but you don't think there's a career in that for you because you're interested in biology as well, there are actually careers as um, medical illustrators or science illustrators. And, and just think of it. Think of all of the test books that you see and all the figures that you, you look at. All of those things are not drawn by scientists. Most scientists are terrible artists. Uh, all of those things are typically drawn by medical and, and science illustrators, people who are art artists who also have to be very knowledgeable of what they're drawing. Um, and again, there are grad programs for this as well. So if you get into science writing and communication, there's actually lots of careers available to you. Here's just a few examples. But think of all of the communication that we have in the world today and and just focus on the science ones, there's lots of publications, lots of newspapers and uh, articles written about science findings and things like that, and you need very good, pe knowledgeable people to write those summaries. So you can be a textbook writer, you can write for magazines, you can be an editor or an illustrator, you can even be a creative writer and just write science fiction, essentially. Um, many science fiction writers have degrees in science, typically. Um, and so on. So there's lots of careers if you ever thought about getting involved in science writing. And the last thing I want to finish with, and I'm not going to go through this, I'm just going to show the list that you can kind of maybe pause the video and look at each one of these, but what I want you to understand is that when we talk about a field like industry or a, a, a branch of a career, you have to understand how many levels of jobs and how many jobs there are within that that we're referring to. And each one of these levels you are qualified as a biology major to get a, uh, a degree in. And in fact, you can go specialized, you can get really creative with advanced degrees to make you very competitive for certain types. So an industry, industry is a private organization essentially that's profit driven, typically, um, to make things, make products or do services for research researchers or, or medicine, clinical um, settings, all right? So here are everything that is, not everything, but the majority of things that are involved with industry, things like market research and sales and marketing and quality control and product development and consults and patent and environmental law, all of those things are involved in being part of an industry, being part of a company. And each one of these bullet points are people who are in these careers doing this job for a broader goal of working in industry. So be aware that just don't say, I want to go into industry. You've got to very be, be very specific. I would like to go into product development and industry. I'd like to make the products. Or I want to test the products and make, th make sure they're really good. That's the quality control part of it. In government careers, all right, there's different levels of government. So in industry, there's obviously market research and things like that. In government, there's lots of careers available. And here's just a... a bunch of them okay so things like a lobbyist someone who actually talks to politicians about about science um, science policy researchers and analysts and FDA administrators um, and we have lots of national parks and, and national refuge uh, wildlife refuges in the country and they hire scientists to work in them right so there's lots of government jobs available as well so you can go back to those, those, those lists and pause them if you really want to, but those are the kind of key terms you're going to want to look at or use when you're looking for jobs. So if you're interested in wildlife refuge, you're going to want to search for jobs in, in, in national parks as and wildlife refuge. So some things that will help you, and I'm going to have you go to this one as part of your homework. This is a great website, the Occupational Outlook Handbook. Um, and this is from the Bureau of Labor Stats, and I'll show you this in a second because this, this is what you're going to do for your homework. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's career services. And then if you're pre-health and all those things I told you, you're not really sure about. So what test do you need to take? When should you be taking those entrance exams? How do you get volunteer experience? How do you shadow? All that stuff. If you have questions for that, you'll definitely just want to email me and set up an appointment because we have our pre-health advising committee. And that's responsible for helping you 
kind of navigate the waters getting into those health careers. And if you're not sure of what health career you want, we can kind of go through them individually and, and talk about um, some of the benefits of each one of those. If you're not pre-health and you're kind of interested in grad school or research, you're really not sure what you want to do. I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. You really want to talk to your faculty members. So let's say you take a course in ecology and you really love the, that course. Go talk to the, the faculty member who is teaching it and ask them, I really love this. How do I get involved in this as a career? What are some of my options? And most faculty will either have to make an appointment if they're too busy to talk to you at that moment, or they'll probably just talk to you at that moment for a half an hour about what careers are available to you. So never be afraid to ask uh, faculty about different careers. Our, our, our job is to try and get you the career that you want and help you be successful for that. How do you find opportunities now? Well. UWF has a great site called JSON Quest. If you go to my UWF and type in JSON Quest, this is essentially a job board, but it's specifically for UWF students. So you can search jobs and internships um, in the local region and start finding things already that you can gain opportunities and, and jobs for. Um, read your email. So many times we'll get ads for internships or things like that, and we'll have the um, academic advisors email them out to you. So don't ignore the emails. It might just say, the subject line might just be opportunity for biology majors. You want to actually click on it because it might be an internship or a job ad um, that you're perfect for that you want to actually apply for. And then of course there's the typical monster.com career, you know, the career builder, biologyjobs.com. And next week when we do, or next module when we do resumes, um, we'll talk about looking for jobs and how to look for a job and things like that. So one more thing you have to do when you start preparing for a career, and it's it, it go back to that activity one on your homework, and it's essentially you have to reflect on what you want, to, what career you want, right? The, most careers in life are not going to fall on your lap. Uh, you have to specifically know what you're looking for, what you want to do, and go after it. And in order to do that, you have to reflect on what are you interested in, and who are you? What, do you like living in this region? Do you want to move somewhere else? Where? And if you did move somewhere else, what, what is around that you could get a job in? Um, so you have to understand those things. You also have to take inventory. So what skills and abilities do you have? And we'll do this next week because we're going to make a resume. And then if you're not sure or I don't have the skills that are going to make me competitive, you want to know that so that you can acquire those skills and hone those abilities while you're not a graduate. So if you're interested in research and you haven't done any research, you definitely want to do research. That'll give you the skills and abilities to be competitive for that. Lastly, as I've said a lot, you want to network with people. Um, most people are in careers that they like and they can help you get the careers that you like. So bottom line, seek diverse experiences both inside and outside the classroom. Obviously, you need to do well in your courses. That's, that's the priority, um, of course. But outside the classroom, you need, you, you need to start gaining experiences while you're an undergraduate, um, and that'll just help you figure out what you want to do. All right, so here's going to be your homework assignment, and um, it's homework number nine, um, My Biology Career, Careers in Biology. And what I want you to do is go to uh, this website, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I'm going to take you to that website right now. All right, so here's the um, occupational handbook, and basically what this is is, the, is run by the uh, Bureau of Labor Stats from the U.S. Department of Labor, and um, it's every job that uh, the U.S. government tracks, and it's information about the job. They give you things like the growth rate of that job, what's the median income of the job, and so on. So what I want you to do for your homework assignment is I'm going to limit you to two categories. You have to either click on the life, physical, and social science, or you have to click on the healthcare. All right, so those are the two kind of biology relevant ones. Um, but if you click on life, physical, and social science, you got to find, find an occupation and just answer the questions in the homework about that occupation. So we can go down to uh, epidemiologists, like we were talking about. And it'll essentially tell you what epidemiologists do. It'll tell you about the work environment. It'll also tell you how to become an epidemiologist. So do you have to go to a, a, a master's program or so on? And up here is the important part. It'll tell you the median pay, all right, typically. So meet member the average pay. Uh, but this one, the job outlook, this is the 10-year job outlook from 2014 to 2024. And you want to look for that because this is basically a 6% growth. You don't want to really look into jobs that have a negative job outlook because it typically means that that career is kind of being phased out. Um, you want to look for more fast growth jobs. All right, so go, go through this and look for something maybe that you haven't seen before, maybe a job that you've never heard about before. 
um, and that you're interested in and fill out that homework. All right, so what you want to do is pick one occupation um, from that list and answer the questions on the handout. Um, and as usual, submit the, the homework via Dropbox by this Sunday at 11.59 p.m. And also, when you're done with this presentation, go ahead over and take quiz number nine. And uh, what we'll do in the next couple modules is we'll talk about actually applying for these jobs and, and kind of the job application process and so on. All right, so I will see you in the next module.